Good afternoon. On behalf of the faculty, staff, and students of the School of Social Work, I too extend a warm welcome to the Edith Harris Endowed Lecture. This lecture offers us the opportunity to honor the memory and legacy of Edith Harris, to hear from an international scholar, and to learn more about this very important topic of cyberbullying. The annual lecture is made possible by the generosity of Mort Harris and the Harris Foundation. Mr. Harris's wife, Edith, was a graduate student in our School of Social Work from 1966 through 1968. But sadly, her untimely death cut short a promising social work career. However, her dream of making a difference in the area of mental health through the advancement of knowledge, scholarship, and practice lives on and is made possible through our annual Edith Harris Endowed Lecture. This year's lecture is delivered by Dr. Faye Mishna, and the lecture is entitled, Understanding and Responding to Cyberbullying in a Cyber World. This is a particularly timely pro topic, and I'm certainly looking forward to learning more from Dr. Mishna, uh, who is an accomplished scholar in this area. Now, I would like to bring up to the podium Dr. Gerald Brandell, and Jerry, as some of us know him as, <laughs> is a past recipient of Wayne State University's Distinguished Faculty Fellowship Award and is a distinguished professor in our School of Social Work. Dr. Brandell is a practicing psychotherapist and psychoanalyst, as well as an author, co-author, editor, co-editor of 10 books. Jerry is also the founding editor-in-chief of, of Psychoanalytic Social Work and serves as an editorial board member of the Clinical Social Work Journal. Jerry also teaches in our MSW Interperson, Interpersonal Practice Concentration, and he teaches our Advanced Year Psychodynamic Theory Track courses. But Jerry also teaches therapeutic storytelling and the celluloid couch. I'll let him tell you about that if he has time. <laughs> Jerry is also the coordinator of our brand new clinical scholarship track in our doctoral program. Dr. Brandell was instrumental in bringing Dr. Mishna to our campus and will now introduce our speaker. Good afternoon. Well, thank you, Dean Waits, for that very uh, generous introduction. Um, much appreciated. I'm very pleased to be able to introduce my good friend and colleague, Dr. Faye Mishna, who will be presenting our 25th annual Edith Harris Lecture in just a few moments. Uh, Faye and I have presented together several times at national conferences and she recently contributed an extremely well-written chapter on bullying and trauma to a, a clinical and research anthology on the topic of trauma that I co-edited. Among her many accomplishments, Faye also serves as a member of the editorial board of the journal you just heard about, Psychoanalytic Social Work. And when we began to think about this lecture and plan for it last year, I was delighted that Dr. Mishna, who is dean of one of the largest and most prestigious schools of social work in Canada, was available and willing to present this lecture. It was very important to us that we adhere to the wishes of the Harris family in bringing you information at the cutting edge of social work practice. And I'm certain that our progressive and dynamic speaker, Dr. Mishna, will not disappoint you. A few words about Faye. Dr. Faye Mishna is Dean and Professor at the Factor Inwintosh Faculty of Social Work, University of Toronto, where she holds the Margaret and Wallace McCain Family Chair in Child and Family, and is cross-appointed to the Department of Psychiatry. Faye worked in children's mental health for over 20 years, and prior to joining the faculty, she was clinical director of a children's mental health center serving children and youth with learning disabilities. She received her PhD from Smith College and her MSW from the University of Toronto. She is also a graduate and faculty member at the Toronto Child Psychoanalytic Program, 
and maintains a small private practice in psychotherapy and consultation. Faye has conducted research on bullying, cyberbullying, cyber counseling, and cyber technology in counseling and interventions with vulnerable children and youth. An integral component of her research entails collaboration with community organizations. Her scholarly publications have focused on bullying, clinical practice, and social work education, and more recently, on cyber technology and counseling. Faye is currently conducting a longitudinal study on cyberbullying among students in grades four, seven, and 10, funded by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. She is also conducting research on the implications of cyber technology for social work practice, funded by Bell. Among Dr. Mishnah's many other publications, she is the author of a book on bullying published by Oxford University Press uh, this, just this past May, May 2012. Signed copies of her book, as you may have noticed, are available for purchase in our lobby. It's now my pleasure to present to you Dr. Faye Mishnah. Thank you very much for the words, and thank you very much for the warm generosity. I feel very welcome here. Just going to... Um, before I start talking about cyberbullying, one of the things I'm often asked is how I got interested in working in bullying. And as Jerry mentioned, before I went to the University of Toronto, I worked in children's mental health for over 20 years. And as clinical director of Integra, this is an agency that works with children and youth who have learning disabilities. So in working with them, one of the things that we were just used to is when we would meet with them and their families and we would ask about the presenting problems, I would say in most cases they talked about being bullied. But it was something that just sort of came with the territory. This was in the uh, late uh, 1980s and early 1990s. It just kind of came with the territory. And then when I went to Smith College to do my PhD, I was doing my dissertation on group psychotherapy, group psychodynamic therapy with these teenagers and kids. And at that time, the kind of group that was offered to this population was usually social skills training, where adults would teach them skills. So this was quite different, because this is where um, it was really interpersonal group therapy where the leader facilitated. So I, I did a qualitative research study where I was interviewing the teenage participants about their experiences in the group. I didn't ask one word about bullying. I was just asking them about the benefits and the challenges in group therapy. And every one of them spontaneously talked to me about how wonderful it felt to be in a group where they didn't have to worry about the fact that they could be bullied or would be bullied. And, and so that became, it's sort of like a wake-up call to me. And as clinical director, I actually went, you know, we, as the agency, we, we changed, we put it in the forefront in realizing that bullying was absolutely huge. And it's interesting because at that time, bullying was not really known, um, it was accepted. At that point, I think it was still, thought the bullying's common, it's normal, it's character form, forming and, and stuff like that. So that's really how I got interested in, in bullying. I just realized it was critical in our work. And I remember even then the kinds of things the kids would say when um, we ran a therapeutic camp and we would ask them, it, you know, about their bullying experiences, they would say things like, oh, it's, it's, it's not so bad, it's a lot better than it used to be, or I've just gotten used to it. All the kinds of things that anybody who works with people who have been abused or any kind of difficult situation understand how um, it was just sort of uh, insidiously affecting their self-esteem so that they, I remember one uh, girl in one of my, uh, in my studies said, you know, when you first get to meet, when you meet me, you'll like me, you'll think I'm smart and nice, but then I'm irritating and then you won't like me anymore. But she didn't say it, and this was typical, they didn't say it as though they were um, mad or upset, it was just something that was a given. Uh, and so then when I went, went to the University of Toronto, it felt like it was very clear for me that I wanted to work on, on bullying. So I'll tell you a little bit about Laurel. Laurel is a girl that I um, worked with in private practice. And this was when I was working, doing research, but uh, her family came to me. She was 15 years old. She was one of those like 
great teenagers who did really well, was very popular, was very responsible. Her parents talked about her as having good judgment. And then the principal phoned the parents one day that there was an online photo of her without her top distributed around the school. So what I'll do is, I just wanted to mention, this is a kind of, so this is one example of cyberbullying. There are many others. Um, and when I, later on, when we talk about, you know, how to work with this, um, these kinds of issues, I'll come back to Laurel. So what I'm going to talk about today, um, first of all, the social media world. When, when we talk about cyberbullying, it kind of overlaps with two things. It overlaps with traditional bullying, because in many ways, it has very similar components. But it also overlaps with the cyber world, because it takes place in the context of the cyber world, which is really, in many ways, a whole new world for us. And there's a term, I don't know if people have heard the term digital natives. So anybody who's like probably 30 and under are digital natives. They have never not known technology, and the rest of us are immigrants. So it's very, very different. <laughs> um, and then I'm going to talk a bit about cyberbullying and its relation to both the cyber world and to offline bullying or traditional bullying. And then I, I thought I'd present two of my research studies of focus groups with, with kids really getting their voices and a cyberbullying survey that was done a couple of years ago. And then what we can do. So let me see if I can get this to work. This is like a 30 seconds about the new cyber world. It's called Magazine is a Broken iPad. Oh, not working. I need help. Okay. Okay. Do you want to go back to the beginning? Yeah. Can you make it? <laughs> She's 12 months old. Watch this little scientist at work. Watch what she does with her finger on her leg. She's just checking it out. It does work. So this is a digital native. Okay. So this is, I think that's a prime example of, of the new cyber world. So social media is absolutely pervasive and it includes and and even as i speak and i mention social networking sites smartphones email youtube blogs every day something new is coming up and i think that's the point um, as of 2011 there were 970 unique facebook visitors worldwide 41 million unique myspace which is going down and 160 million unique twitter visitors worldwide um, and the thing about the cyber world, I think, and it's important, I feel it's important to start with this because when we, when the news, when we hear about uh, cyber bullying problems and tragic 
um, the outcomes of cyberbullying, it's very easy to think of the cyber world and youth as only a problem. But it's important to remember that in many ways it, it has tremendous benefits. So we can't get rid of it, and, and that's actually too late to get rid of it anyways. It really is a new cyber world. So we un need to understand the benefits and then understand the risks. But it really does provide unprecedented opportunities for young people to communicate. And again, for good and for bad, with for benefits and with challenges. And it's always advancing, and it's not going to stop. And it's advancing at a, at a huge rate, which is, has the rate at which is at the rate at which it is advancing, and the the um, expertise of the young children and how they know more about adults is really critical because. In, in terms of parents, teachers, and clinicians, we really need to understand that because that causes a lot of the discrepancy and a lot of the problems. So the new media really influences. When we talk about the ecological system, um, person in their environment, we've always talked about the child, family, school, community, society, but we really have to include the cyber world. And, and if you look up ecological system now, you will see the technological system is in there because we really need to address that. And, and just as an aside, often we don't. So when you think about um, clinicians, when they meet, somebody comes into an agency, we often don't include in the assessment what they're, what they're like in the cyber world. We don't take that vulnerability into account, which is really incredible, which is really important. The cyber world affects individuals, young and old, and across all social locations. And again, even in the five or six, I, I think I started my study about six years ago, and in those, in that time, six or seven years ago, the change is dramatic. At that point, when um, we were doing our focus groups, and I found out about Facebook from the youth, I, I, no, no adults that I knew knew of Facebook. So it's just dramatic, and at that time, um, most of what we knew with kids knowing it. So, and many adults would say, I'm never getting onto Facebook, I don't think it's real. And as everybody knows, things have really changed. And then handheld devices have made a huge difference in, in the impact. So as I said, I think what's important is that we need to maximize the benefits and minimize the risks associated with cyber communication, recognizing that we can't get rid of the risks completely, but also we need to recognize there are tremendous benefits and we need to address that. And that's what makes it very complex. So, you know, when I talk about it with people, um, and, and it, it's interesting to take a minute and reflect on your own engagement in the cyber world and even how that's changed in the last year. And it can easily creep into professional therapeutic practice, for example, as well as personal relationships. In terms of therapeutic practice, um, I think, as, as most people know, there's um, quite a lot of cyber counseling or e-therapy that takes place. And that's a unique kind of uh, intervention where it, it happens on a secure server and there's certain guidelines. But if you speak to any practitioner, um, I was going to say particularly with kids, but I think it really applies to, to most people at this point who do traditional counseling face-to-face -face and don't consider themselves doing cyber technology, if you ask, or even you know, anybody here who's in the audience, if you think about it, um, have clients contacted you to, or them to, um, to change an appointment? And, and most people will, will say yes, and there's no issue about that. And then the, the next question might be, and have they ever added by the way? And the by the way might be something therapeutic. Or did you ever, you know, somebody send you an email and you didn't expect it, or asked you to befriend you on Facebook. So these are the kinds of things that happen. And again, it doesn't quite fit with what I'm talking about today, but it's important because it's all part of the cyber world. And I know some people have said to me, well, the way they would deal with that is they just don't give out their email address or they just, for example, on Facebook, they'll just ignore the request. Well, if you don't give out your email address, it doesn't really matter because it's public information. So somebody can still access you. It's different than finding your private number. And if you ignore somebody on Facebook and they're your client, for example, you've ignored them. So how are you going to address that? That still affected the relationship. So similar to cyberbullying, we can't, or cyber technology use among kids, it's, we can't say we're not going to do it, we're not going to deal with it, we're just not interested. Just like many adults um, have said, and I think still do say, but maybe less so, saying, well, I don't know anything about it, and I can't learn anything about it, I'm too, I'm too old. Again, that's the, you know, the old immigrant kind of view. But 
that's, it's, that's not a feasible approach, and um, maybe that's something we can talk about more. Here's an example. I love this one. <laughs> Steve meets Moses. Steve is here today. <laughs> so basically, the technological advances have forever changed how we communicate and interact. And it's just something that's happened and it's going to keep happening. And as I mentioned, children and youth are sophisticated users of technology. Just like that 12-month-old baby, that's really what they learned. Whoever knew that somebody, there would come a day where a baby doesn't know how to turn a page on a magazine. And as I mentioned, youth acquire technological competence much faster than their parents. And that heightens the risks because the kids who are using it still need guidance, but the people who need to give them guidance know a lot less about this. And that's one of the reasons why adults need to learn about it, because that really does put the kids more at risk. Youth, and I would say at this point, adults too, more and more seek connections, information, personal assistance, entertainment, basically everything online. So here's another example. Can I just email you a link to my blog? So, and it's interesting, when I first did this slide, I had, uh, before I saw the baby um, video, I had, had technologies in their DNA, and then I realized that, that ages me, it's really in their OS, it's their operating system. So, in Canada, 98% of youth use cyber technology daily, 95% use email, 85% use instant messaging. As I said, they're digital natives. They've never known a world without technology. That's really important. They've never known a world without technology. In, in the States, it's very similar. 93%, 63% go of youth, 12 to 17, go online daily. And again, if these statistics are a year old, it's, they're, they're already outdated. It's just dramatic. And this is one that's a bit older. It was talked about kids having webcams and using websites. And at that point, 28% of grade, students in grades four used instant messaging, but I think it's probably much closer to 90% at this point. So navigating, there's certain features of communication technology that create additional relational complexities, and I think that's what's really important. And they increase the likelihood of misunderstanding and conflict. So, for one thing, they're so often, they happen so often, and they're so spontaneous. And an important area that I think a lot of research, we need to really understand the implications of this, is the absence of the usual social and contextual cues. And there's the perception of anonymity. What's interesting to me is it's still often talked about as though it's anonymous, and in the current study that I'm doing, when we interview kids and we ask their definition of cyberbullying, we ask their definition of bullying and cyberbullying, and they all say, I don't know all, but a lot of them say cyberbullying is anonymous. But in fact, it's often not anonymous. The research is showing that. And as they keep talking in their interview, it's clear it's not anonymous in their cases either. But there's a perception of anonymity, which is very important in terms of uh, the, how it affects the person who's doing it. Um, and the other thing about, it's an interesting thing about the cyber world because children and youth are at a point where they're still dependent, they're getting more, they're becoming more independent, but they still need guidance. And social uh, communication and the social media and also the, especially the handheld devices gives kids a level of freedom that developmentally they're not ready for. So they're not supervised at all. And even though we talk about the importance of supervision, it's, it, it's harder to navigate that. It's harder to put that into practice. So they, they still need the guidance in order to make the best choices when utilizing these technologies. So the paradox is they, they know so well how to use it. Like this baby, when she's two, three, four, five, we can imagine she's going to be wonderful at it. But that doesn't mean she has the cognitive or emotional ability to handle what happens in that world. And that's really where the, the problems happen, and that's really where adults need to come in, and communication and openness is very critical. So as I said, I think it's important to talk about some of the benefits. So as a, one big one is unprecedented 
opportunities for communication, learning, and self-exploration. It gives crucial resources and support, both informal and formal. And when you think about populations of kids and adults who have not, or who don't get support, and, and for whatever reason might be stigmatized or dealing with some marginalization, if they don't have an area where they can get support in school or with their families or a natural peer group, the, the internet, the online world gives them that. And, and we know for development that's absolutely critical, a place where you can have support, feel understood, feel validated, feel you're not alone, that there are other people like you. And again, there's informal and formal supports. And research has shown that most online interactions are actually positive or neutral, and that in fact a lot of the interactions among kids increase the intimacy in their relationships and are very, very positive. A big thing is it can decrease social isolation. It can um, normalize feelings of distress if somebody can't talk about something with other people or at school or with their family, they can do it there. It's a way to self-disclose and compare oneself and again, feel not so alone. And for groups, as I mentioned, so LGBTQ, who might not be able to, often when we talk about bullying and cyberbullying, the, the standard uh, message has always been, tell an adult, tell a teacher, or tell a parent. But, um, and I know some of the research I've done, but we also know that for, that's, that's actually not um, a very safe thing to say to all kids, because for some kids, so for example, a youth is who's LGBTQ, if they go tell a teacher or they go tell a parent, they might actually be more at risk. We don't know that that's gonna be positive for them to be able to do that. And they might know that it's not possible. And again, the online world can give them a place of support. And again, the, the paradox is the place where they get the support, and which is very critical, might also be a place where they're gonna be at risk for other problems. And that goes back to, keeps going back to why we need adults to be involved and open and, and knowing about this and opening lines of communication. But we can't discount the importance of that kind of support for, for children and youth. So risks, we know about the risks. 50% of adolescents have said they've experimented with their identity online. And um, it's interesting, I don't know if you remember, um, most of them pretend to be older. I don't know if you remember, a few years ago there were a lot of public service announcements that had a picture of this man who was middle-aged and his, his name was, let's say, George. And the announcement, the ad said that he was, he was pretending to be Sally or Joe or whatever, and he was like pretending to be 13 years old. And the message was to kids, beware, because this is what's out there, adult men pretending to be young, and that they would seduce young kids, young boys and girls in that way. And in fact, David, Finkel, David Finkelhor and Janice Wallach, they did uh, research on that, and what they found uh, is quite the opposite. They found that these men, there were men out there, and are men out there, who are finding young boys and girls, but the men are not being deceptive about their age. They're actually saying their age. They're saying, so if they're 50, they might say they're 45. The way they're being deceptive is they're luring the kids, developing a relationship with them online, and making them feel understood and loved. And that becomes the deceit, that they're presenting the relationship as something other than it is. And so for these kids who are very vulnerable, that's what really gets them. And the point of um, their, this research was we need to know what it is that kids and adults are doing, because it's the kids who are pretending that they're older. So they might say, oh, by the way, I'm really not 18, I'm 14. And then the older man would email back and say it doesn't matter to him. But it's really important to know what's happening, because the intervention needs to be guided by that. So in this case, it's the kids who are pretending to be older. And the deception by the men is, a, is the idea that they want them for love and that they feel love for them, when in fact, that, that is not true. And then about 50% say that um, they, oh, I think I talked about that. The other risk is it can, it can reinforce, just like it can provide support for vulnerable youth that's really positive, it can also reinforce negative or under, unhealthy views. So for example, um, there's sites for anorexia, how to do it without anybody seeing it, self-injury, pedophile, and violence and terror. So those are also some of the risks. 
And then there's the risks of bullying, sexual solicitation or victimization, and exposure to pornography. There was a study recently that talked about we often...